Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Remote No Pressure podcast. We're so glad that you chose to hang out with us uh, for another week. This week's a great week. Don't forget to go back and listen to episode number 50, uh, the clip show. We have clips from some of our, our guests that we've had over the past um, over the past 50 episodes. So it was a fantastic uh, interview. Also, we teamed up with Deli Fresh Design to create an official Remote No Pressure Sling Pack. Be sure to go check that out at remotenopressure.com. A sweet digital camo. Um, it's a great bag. Be sure to check that out. This week, we have, an, we have a great guest. We have Yako Lucas from Captain Jack Productions. If you've been to Fly Fishing Film Tour, if you're, if you, if you're into fly fishing movies at all, you probably know who Yako Lucas is. It's an excellent episode. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, I'm very honored to have the guest with us um, from Captain Jack Productions, Mr. Yako Lucas. Thank you very much, Yako. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Jeff. I um, really appreciate it. Now, just reading over your bio, I know a lot of our listeners are very familiar with your work, uh, either through the Fly Fishing Film Tour. I know you, you won some awards from the Drake um, and, and a few other things as well. But um, before we get started into all of your accolades and what people know you for, I wanted to first talk about you, Yako. Um, now, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? So I'm 35 now, turning 36, um, but I presume I still feel like I'm 15 years old and get excited <laughs> as I would the first time I ever went out fishing. So for, for me, I, you know, it's funny. I think there's definitely a certain age you reach where you completely kind of just get on with it and kind of forget about birthdays and everything. You just <laughs> The years tick by so quickly. So, um, yeah. Well, the reason why I asked, I know, and, and I've ne- I don't think I've ever asked any of my guests, especially my female guests, you know, how old they are. But the reason I ask you is yeah. because you're, you're from Johannesburg. Did I say that right? How do you say it? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Johannesburg. That's, uh, that's correct. That's where I was born and raised. Um, spent a lot of my time on the Eastern coast where I learned kind of a lot of the saltwater fishing, but yeah, um, from Johannesburg. And, and, yeah. And, and the reason I answer South Africa, were you exposed to apartheid i mean do you remember any of that uh, yes you know um the, the, the funny thing about not that there's a funny thing about it at all but uh, my dad was actually in the police force for 27 years and he kind of um we we were very aware as a family of of everything that was going on you know i was i was i'm an Afrika, i'm afrikaans person which is uh which is also kind of referred to as a boer which is a, a farmer um, that's our, uh, that's kind of the, the, the history of it. And, uh, and um, you know, uh, we definitely got brought up through it. We, we day, day to day, everything kind of went on. You kind of knew that there was definitely something going on and some oppression and, and there, there was stuff that wasn't not, that was not completely right. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to see what, what, what can happen. Um, I mean, there's, there's obviously still a lot of things going on, but I think South Africa is definitely now in a much better position than it used to be. Um, it's, it's always going to take some time, but I definitely think, uh, South Africa, there's, uh, I, I'm a very positive person. So I look at everything from a very positive aspect and always see that there's a better in somebody or something. And I think that, uh, South Africa is still an amazing place and, and, Regardless of what anybody's heard bad about it, it is a beautiful place. You have to go and see it. It's awesome. Yeah, it it seems you know all all the videos and things that I've seen. It looks like an amazing place. I've never been, but I would love to go. Um, did that? Did going growing up in South Africa during that very uh, interesting time in history? Um, did that affect you? How did that affect your worldview? as you grew older, because you ended up going to London, you went, you know, you've had quite the career, but did, did that impact your worldview? Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I kind of feel like it, uh, it, the whole apartheid thing ended up, um, I think it made a lot of people very stubborn and very narrow minded. It kind of ends up being a kind of a tunnel vision way. So I think a lot of people grew up, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible. Like I said, very tunnel vision and, and things can only be a certain way and you not, you're very scared of broadening your horizons. But I, I think the nice thing about the generation that I grew up in is luckily for us in when we went to school, we started seeing that change and we started seeing, uh, the impact that Mandela had, had. And then, uh, there was the 95 uh, rugby world cup that was just where the nation kind of, you could see something is happening where people started getting together. 
I mean, just circling back again with the with the bad stuff and my dad being in the police force. I mean, he was a bomb instructor and he saw some absolutely terrible things that came out of apartheid and stuff that he's told me that that no person should really ever see. Um, and uh, and that's and that's that's a scary thing to see. But again, like I said, my whole mind frame and brain has always worked very positive. So, like I said, in school we started seeing that transformation and and in sports and everything and. Definitely, people are becoming a little bit more wise to the world, and that was my outlook to it. Is, is I wanted to definitely at some point leave South Africa to go and experience different cultures and see how other people perceive South Africa and how other. I mean, we ended up going to London, and there was at that stage already seven hundred thousand South Africans in London um, working as students and stuff. So there was still a very strong South African community, but uh, but uh, it was amazing to just learn other cultures and people and uh and that's that's amazing that's always good to see and it definitely opens your mind a little bit yeah i, I couldn't agree with you more Yako. being exposed to other cultures other world views other ideas really um it's an amazing experience it really changes who you are um did you grow up in a family that was was like that that embraced change or were you kind of uh, a unique individual inside of your family Yako? Um, I, it's, it's difficult to say from, you know, my, my, my parents and grandparents and, and family has always been kind of a very, uh, friendly, uh, bunch of people kind of open and again, also very positive mind frame. Um, and looking over stuff, my mom was a teacher, um, and she was a teacher at the same high school, uh, that I went to and, um, and, uh, she was awesome. And, and like I said, the rest of my family and, and that, that I'm very lucky in that sense that they brought me up the right way to kind of accept anybody for who they are and, um, and, and, and help me a lot in that sense and never really judge anybody by color, ethnicity or anything like that. Because I mean, if you, th- if you look at South Africa too, I mean, we've got, we've got 11 official languages. Um, there is a lot of different races of people and, and um, and it's it's I mean it's still a third world country as a lot of a lot of African countries are. But you know the more I've also travelled now to th- different third world countries, you know there's definitely the poverty poverty side of stuff and the lack of education. But sometimes you find these like little villages like this one we just went to in Lesotho where those people have nothing but they couldn't be more happy in this world. They don't have stress about politics or internet or anything like that, and they are just happy and going by their lives and. And it's awesome to see that. And that's why I couldn't tell people more to just get out of their house and go and try and see these things. Totally agree. And that's that's one of the things. I don't know, Yako, if you've listened to any of the episodes in the past, but that's what we really focus on is fly fishing and how it, it can change the world that way. Um, just by getting outdoors, experiencing life away from the computer. Now, you are a man. I mean, your Instagram's crazy. Some awesome pictures on there. Tons of followers. There is <laughs> Facebook. There's, you know, videos. There's movies. I mean, it's it's a full-time job, just social media. When you see someone, when you go into these villages, and you see them really just living life without that, I mean, do you ever just want to just say, screw it, I'm going to just shack up in the village and be done with it? <laughs> yeah. no i actually i actually had somebody said exactly that to me the other day they just said like i think social media is getting a bit of them they just want to go and work somewhere where there's no cell phones or anything like that i mean it's <laughs> it's you know it's it's a love-hate relationship for sure i mean so we i think we definitely need to embrace social media the fact that it's helping us build our industry which it definitely is um you know it's it's helping us in a lot lot better ways to kind of share our stuff and and get especially younger generations of people involved. Although we're trying to teach them to get outside, we're still trying to show them what what's out there to experience. So, you know, it's so difficult to 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 say like you can just drop everything because there's definitely sometimes that I'll just take like a super social media cleanse where I'll just do nothing for a week and just just be away from it. And it's <laughs> you know the funny thing is you get back to it, it's still there. It's 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 there. You see sketch up on some good stuff. It's but your world's not end. It, it's not, it's not like the world stopped. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's good to take a break from it sometimes. Yeah, I totally agree. But yet it's, it's part of our life now. It's part of who we are. It's part of, um, so many business models. You can't just go away from it, but you can definitely appreciate those villages that you go to. Um, now let me ask you this question, Yako. 
Now, I know that Captain Jack Productions, um, start, you know, you, you kind of came up with this idea in 2009. Um, what was yeah. it like between 2009 and 2012? Because it was officially established in 2012. What went in those three years? What, what was going on, Yako? Look, to be honest with you, <laughs> I've, I've said this a couple times before, but, you know, I, I'm a firm believer of the, of the word fake it till you make it. Um, I've, I've always, you know, at that period of time, I was just teaching myself how to kind of pick up a camera, start taking photos, um, you know, just, uh, just slowly getting into it, just doing like super homemade I, little things. I mean, I've got stuff on a hard drive that is uh, terribly done, but, uh, it's still, you know, it's, it's a learning curve and, um, and I'll, I'll never, you know, it's, um, it's, it's all of it. I mean, a lot of that kind of stuff, the videography stuff and even fly fishing itself was something that I taught myself, although I grew up in a family or well, my dad is, uh, and my granddad is, uh, have been in fishing their whole lives. And my dad's actually a competitive rock and surf angler that catches big sharks and things for, 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 for the fun of it and releases them. And I, I did the same, but, um, the fly fishing aspect was something I started doing completely on my own, um, and and learned that. And same with the camera stuff. I, you know, the more time you spend with clients, the more you realize that you are making some of their dreams come true. And to capture that moment just sets you apart from the rest to make sure that you capture it in a good way. I, I still believe that there are a lot better photographers, videographers, uh, editors, guys like Salt Soul Media, Biadi Outdoor Productions, Tollwag Media that do incredible jobs of editing and making movies. But uh, I, my stuff is very raw, and I think it's it, it kind of speaks to some people in a sense that, I mean, they can maybe go out and try and do some stuff and, and just introduce them to some, some cool things. But there was definitely a period where I was kind of just figuring stuff out um, until I, until I mean, the 2012 thing when it kicked off is I literally uh, got an uh, email from Tom Bai from the Drake. Um, he saw something uh, that I... Uh, put together for GTs and asked if I could do something for the Drake Awards in 2012. And I was guiding in Norway at the time. And when I'm in Norway, I guide 18 hours a day. So I was literally guiding, editing for two, three hours, trying to sleep like an hour, sometimes sleeping while I'm standing up on the river um, and eventually got the award for, for Gangsters of the Flat. And I mean, it all kind of went on from there. Wow. That's incredible. Now, when you set out on this journey, I mean, did did anyone in your family say, "Hey, Yako, why don't you become an accountant or do like get a real job"? <laughs> <laughs> I've I've heard that so so many times. You know, I I mean, I I did end up like the one thing I did want to do is, is I just wanted to get get an education off the university. Uh, well, I got a, deg- a bachelor's degree in marketing, but I think that that more adds to helping in in me learning things. It might not. I love marketing and I love like sharing stuff with other people and, and coming up with some creative ideas, but um, it definitely helps you think and get some discipline going. And, um, and I, I knew immediately after university, I, I actually finished university with the idea that I'm going to be in the fly fishing or fishing industry. So um, that never crossed my mind and I'm a very stubborn person. And, and, uh, and I mean, I just went for it. Uh, this, how it started is I met a guy called Keith Rosinus just randomly on a beach in, in South Africa and East London. And, he had just finished a season in Russia and he told me kind of what to do, where to go. I ended up doing exactly what he said. A year later, I was, I was at Farlow's working in a shop for a year and I said to him, do you have any guiding jobs for me? And he said, come over. And two weeks later, I was in the Seychelles. So like I said, I, I, I get quite a lot of emails and people asking how it's done. And I kind of feel like you just have to go out on a limb and never – Never it sounds a little bit sort of cliche, but never stop dreaming. Just go for it. Why do you think some people stop dreaming? You, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like, you know, I've heard this. This is one thing that I've heard a lot before about some of the movie stuff I've done. It's like people go, yeah, we're we doing another movie about a place that I'm never going to be able to go to. And, and if you want to look at it that way, you can look at it that way. But I feel like I'm creating that dream. Like, I mean, I grew up in a very poor family and, I managed to see all these places by doing what I'm doing and going out there and never stopping to stop doing what I'm doing. Like, I mean, guiding seems like a glamorous job, but it's still like something you need to work hard at. You scrubbing boats, you, 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 you hardly get to fish. So 
I mean, there's a lot of aspects of the fishing industry that's very extremely non-glamorous, um, but you have to go through all that kind of stuff to to reach that point where you go to some crazy place or um, – but you have to keep at it. You can never stop like, a, oh, no, so now I'm never going to be able to do it. you got to go for it. Yeah. You got, what, why do you think, I mean, you talked about your dad. You, what, what did he do? He was a, a surf fisherman. What, what did you say? Yeah, so, so um, he, we, we do some, uh, uh, in South Africa, there's, a, there's a, a method of fishing we call rock and surf fishing, where basically you, you have these 14-foot rods, um, multiplier or spinning reels, and you you cast out these big baits into the surf and then you catch giant sharks and and that's what I grew up doing and you you fight these fish these sharks for or big fish for however long you land them in the comp- competitive side of things you'll for for every kilogram the fish weighs you get a point and that's how the whole system works and eventually it's like different provinces that compete against each other and there's a national and international tournament but that's kind of one of the more more well-known fishing method of fishing in South Africa. It's it's a lot of fun, um, but I, I just kind of took on the, the the challenge of fly fishing. And once that addiction kicks in, you kind of it's not you know fly fishing is also sometimes perceived as this um, this elitist thing, but I just see it as an addiction thing, like addiction to try and get it on fly. <laughs> I have no problem with the guy catching a fish whichever way he wants. You can go noodle a great white if you want to, but do whatever makes you happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question to you is this. I've known several people from South Africa, okay? I went to college with, with a few guys from South Africa. I've got friends that are from South Africa. Why are, like, look, I grew up in Texas. Guys would, like, brag about catching largemouth bass. But for some reason, South <laughs> Africans don't stop there. They go out on the rocks and catch giant sharks. My question to you, Yako, is why are South Africans so damn tough? <laughs> man i can tell you now that we are in honest in all honesty like when you when you start guiding you kind of get to know the, the guiding industry and then you kind of get to know the different clientele and it's going to sound very strange to you so top clients ever that i've had are always americans 99 percent of the times americans are the best so Africans, 100% of the times, could be some of the toughest clients you'll ever have. Reason being is they could be nice people, but they're super stubborn. We love doing <laughs> DIY. We love doing stuff our way. We love not listening to what people have to say. <laughs> we just want to it's, – it's, it's terrible, but it's, it's, we're, I, I feel like we're kind of also a very proud nation, and we'll, we'll, we'll break something three times before we go, okay, can you help us with this, please? Um, so it's – it's sometimes frustrating, and especially now that I've gotten to know a lot more people. Now that I live in the U.S., um, you know, it's uh, it's it's you see South Africans from from another perspective, but they are amazing people. And and you know, some of the best saltwater fly anglers that I've seen are definitely South Africans, just purely because they are super hardcore. <laughs> they don't stop, man. Just they just go. They'll they will keep going. You know. Um, you know, the whole GT thing, um, and I think the the initial groups that we went in with to the Seychelles helped us learn so much about the GT fisheries because they, cause those guys were just trying to catch GTs wherever. And, um, and uh, I mean, the, the way that we would fish for GTs in South Africa is, is casting in a surf, getting beaten up by waves with a stripping basket, casting, like, I mean, weeks on end to maybe get one one eat or something like that and potentially not even landing that fish. So we grow up fishing pretty hard to get, to, to get. So we, we can appreciate something good, but we don't stop. Yako, what's your most memorable fish? I know they're all memorable and that you love them all, but there's got to be that one story that really sticks out to you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's exactly, there's, there's a lot of things. Um, you know, it, it, you mean out of a personal capacity or with a client? Yeah, either one or in any crazy trip that you remember. What is that one experience, either fishing or not catching fish, that really stands out to you in your memory? Can you tell us that story, Yako? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I mean, you know, my uh, the biggest part of my career obviously has revolved around GTs and, and GT fishing. And, uh, and um, 
you know, like I've, like I've always said, it's, it's so hard to, to tell somebody exactly what's going to happen when the GT comes down the flat and you need to make that cast and everything. And, and, you know, there's this moment, I think one of the most unique situations that I've ever been in. And, and that's actually one of the clips that's in Gangsters of the Flat where I'm wearing the GoPro on my head. You know, we, we had at that day, we had a pretty good, good day so far. We actually had, I had two South Africans with me, funnily enough, but, like one of them had fished with me quite a few times and the other was actually pretty new. Um, great people, good people. And, um, and we had already that day caught like 20 GTs, which is phenomenal. Um, I'm not big on the numbers game, but it, it was really, it was like a standout day for, for Farquhar at all. Sure. And, you know, this, this fish, like my cameras were all dead. I was trying to take as much footage as possible at that stage, just, just like, like trying to get as much as I could. And the only battery I had left was half a battery on my GoPro. And, one of my clients was casting on a on a on an edge of the lagoon, and I literally just had a glimpse. GTs would sometimes just. I always tell clients they're always cruising to feed some uh, feed because they always want to find something to kill. But this time, this big. I mean, it was it was over a hundred and forty pound GT, literally sitting next to a rock, and it was sitting dead still, probably waiting to ambush something that it seen, and. Like I said, I started going into all sorts of colorful language, trying to tell the client where the fish was. <laughs> he made the cast, and I mean, he's a great guy, but the cast wasn't even almost where, where I wanted it to be. But I just told him to keep stripping, and the fish came up, and literally, I mean, it ate the fly. You can see in that video, it's it's less than a rod length away, up into the leader, and roost the tail, and popped the whole head, came out, ate the fly, and just turned around and went, and we had that before I could get to my skiff to pick him up, that fish had already emptied the spool and broke the line by the time I got there. It was an absolute giant GT. So, oh I mean, it's, 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 it's scary what those fish would sometimes do. They, that's, I mean, exactly why we call them the gangsters of the flat is because they will just literally, they never look happy. They always look like they want to kill something or they're hungry or um, I've never seen any GT ever attacked by anything, but, other GTs, or if they are pretty much tired of fighting. I've seen once a Barracuda came in for a snack just because the GT was vulnerable. But otherwise, I've seen them chase sharks away from an area. Um, they, it's difficult. Like, I mean, I always say to people, there's so many fish to fish for in this world, and the bucket list is never ending. But, man, a GT is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> They're kind of like South African fish, huh? They're really tough. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Stupid, hard-headed, will never... It's, yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. No. But I mean, I have to say, though, I, I kind of feel like um, a lot of people should never underestimate Jack, Jack Ravel, Jack Fishing. It's the cousin of the GT, and I feel like they haven't gotten enough of a good rap. And, uh, man, I'd fish for those all day long. Um, they're also awesome. That's excellent. Have you ever felt uh, scared for your life while you're out there doing all these crazy things, Yako? Um, you know, we, we, we've been, we, I've been very fortunate, touch wood, that uh, nothing really bad has happened. All, all the situations, I've been in some situations which gets a little bit, um, little bit iffy, but, you know, in, and the more you travel, the more you kind of can try and learn to control panic. And especially when you're with clients, you always have to seem calm, even if you are shitting yourself. <laughs> you have to just seem like really relaxed. But, uh, I mean, there's been t times where I've struggled to get to my boat because the tides pushed me off. I've seen some giant uh, tiger sharks circling us around. But, you know, the funny thing is, is and the more I tell it to clients, is like if, if you are scared of sharks, just in any way try and calm yourself or don't even look at it when it's there because the guy that panics, the shark comes to him. I've had a client. The worst I've had is where a client literally jumped on my back and rode me like Zorro to get away from a shark. Wow. Which was just, then stuff gets bad because then I'm trying to get this guy calmed down and it's just, I mean, he's panicking. The shark's going to come in harder the more you thrash. Um, and again, like I said, I grew up around sharks fishing for them. So I'm completely relaxed around them. But it's, yeah, it, it can get a bit tough sometimes calming clients. What's next? But, uh, what? Yeah, I'm... Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. That, that's that's. What's what's next for you, Yako? I mean, you you've have so many accomplishments. I mean, what what are you shooting for? What's next? Um, jeez, uh, at the moment, probably busy with 100 things at the same time. But uh, 
um, you know, uh, definitely I'm never going to stop trying to fish every single place in this world. So, I mean, I've got a pretty hefty calendar this year. Um, after the fly fishing film to South Africa, heading to Cuba, then uh, Australia, Kamchatka, the Bahamas, uh, um, uh, Bolivia, Tanzania, Seychelles. Um, and and then the that's just till the end of the year. And then just keep on going for some new stuff, going to Guyana. Um, and I'm actually busy with the piece now that I'm writing for one of the magazines about uh, about Gabon and Africa. And I still feel like there's so much more frontiers and places to discover in Africa that, you know, it's unfortunately, it's, it's not always the safest places to go to. Um, but I still think that there's some really cool stuff to find to find in there and my I'm, I'm at this stage i'm very obsessed about trying to catch a big top and from the beach in africa i've been out there now for two weeks it's never been i, I haven't been able to do it yet um I've, I've caught them from a boat but not from the beach yet and i'm not going to stop until i do it well that's awesome yaka well thank you sure. for, thank you very much for taking some time with us if people wanted i know a lot of people already know but if people want to know more about what you're doing um, check out your material and your trips. Where would they go to do that, Yako? Um, they can definitely go to my website. I'm going to try and just update it a little bit more with regards to some of the trips that I'm going on. Um, uh, I've got a new website up, uh, captainjackproductions.com, and uh, definitely they can go and check that out. There's some cool fishing stuff, um, uh, some video stuff. I'm going to definitely try um, to try and put some more newer stuff, video stuff on. Um, I'm busy with some new stuff. The African Tiger should be out once the South African film tour is done, so that should be cool. Uh, but yeah, I've got a lot of cool stuff and cool ideas coming, and there's going to be some pretty wild uh, adventures in the near future. Well, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Jaco, and uh, we'll put all those links on our website at remotenopressure.com. And we just really appreciate you, Yako. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate that. Thank you for hanging out with us on another episode of the Remote No Pressure podcast. Be sure to check out our website at remotenopressure.com. Check out our Facebook, our Instagram, and all that. And until next time, go fishing.